Macabrepedia deals with dark subject matter that may not be suitable for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. June 22nd, 1934. The notorious gangster John Dillinger, a man who headed the Dillinger gang, who robbed 24 banks and four police stations, a man who escaped from prison twice, was gunned down in Chicago as he left a movie theater where he had just finished watching the movie Manhattan Melodrama starring Clark Gable. The cops shot him four times and he fell to the ground and died in an alleyway. The next day, a mortuary student named Marjorie McDougall and her professor, Dr. D.E. Ashworth, went to the morgue and made a death mask of the man's face. As the plaster on the mold hardened, a police sergeant burst into the room and took the mold from them heading to the police vault. Marjorie followed him, distracting him long enough for Ashworth to make a second plaster mold, which they smuggled outside. This mold was then used to make a handful of masks, which have sold for upwards of $10,000. The death mask is so detailed that you can see the bullet's exit wound under his eye and a scuff mark on his cheek from where he fell on the pavement when he was gunned down. One of the most famous death masks, this has also been a source of arguments and conspiracy with some people questioning if Dillinger even died that day outside of the Biograph Theater in Chicago, Illinois. We invite you to stay and listen as we add another entry into this, our Macabrepedia. Hello, and welcome to Macabrepedia, a marriage of true crime and the truly bizarre. I am Matthew. And I'm Marissa. Today we will be exploring the macabre practices around death masks ah so a death mask funerary mask life masks are they're all very similar but different uh in intent or materials a funerary mask was more something that would be left with the body or used in rituals of remembrance where a death mask or life mask was more of a plaster casting of the face that results in more of a bust or statue-like artifact that is not something that would be left on or with the body. Right. So today I'm going to be talking about death masks, uh, but I will be using this term to also include funerary masks and life masks. At one point or another, they've all been referred to as death masks, and I'll be using this term interchangeably. Some were carved to resemble a deceased person's face, some were made from a plaster cast made from a corpse's face, and some were made from a plaster cast also, but from the person when they were alive. If you Google death mask, you'll see examples of all of these. So these masks were actually made for a variety of reasons, just sometimes as a way for artists to have a realistic version of the face before decay and bloat distorted the body. Because after a while, of course, you know, your corpse is going to look pretty grody. But so they would try to do this so they could get an accurate representation before they started doing their painting or their sculpture. Historians can sometimes tell if a piece of art was made from the subject in life or from a death mask, as the death mask is sometimes distorted from its own weight as well. So, for instance, there's Shakespeare's death mask, which was found in a junk shop and believed to be that of William Shakespeare. For one thing, it has the year he died carved onto the back of it, and it looks like him. Scientists have lined up different features on his face from the death mask and from portraits of him, and they believe that this is his. This one is believed to have been made more than 24 hours after he died because the eyes are decomposing and the conjunctiva or the mucous membranes that line the eye and eyelids are decomposing. And the decomp is gumming up the eyelashes on the death mask. So it's really, it's, it's, it's creepy looking. Um, historians believe that some of his portraits were drawn from this mask. So do all, so is he Shakespeare's? All of Shakespeare's portraits have him looking like he's got pink eye or is like something <laughs> stuck in his eye. No, not all of them, but some of them. Really? That's what they think. Though, I mean, there, there's some there's some speculation as to whether or not he even existed as a person, right? Uh huh. I don't agree with that. I think you. I think he was real. Uh, well, okay, but. But yes, just... there is. There is. There are whole all books written on it. Okay. I think some of them think Marlowe. Yeah, and Lord Byron or whatever yeah. was 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 actually or a him. woman did it. But they're 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 just pretty sure that this ha happens to be him. This could be this could just be the death mask that everybody built Shakespeare off of. So moving on, the science um, of making these were not perfect. The death mask of Thomas Paine 
And if you've ever taken a U.S. history class in America, um, you know that he wrote the pamphlet Common Sense, which advocated independence from Great Britain for the 13 colonies. He wrote that, and his death mask has a squished nose on it because the plaster did not dry fully before it was removed. And the weight of the mask actually leans the nose to the side. So it looks like he has a broken nose, but it's just the fact that the mask didn't dry fully. He just had such a big old honker that it, oh, yeah. it couldn't support its own weight. It just leaned over all on its own. It's also interesting to see a side-by-side -side of Beethoven's masks, because he had one taken when he was alive and then one after he died. So if you look at him, like, the one where he was alive, he looks kind of annoyed. Just a little slightly annoyed, like, can we hurry up? Can I get this done? Like, I just want to go compose whatever. Like, <laughs> I'm working on a Moonlight, sin uh, what is it? Sin Moonlight Sonata right now. You, you, like, you think that they just, like, burst into his room and was like, we're, we're going to plaster your face real quick. I don't know. <laughs> he didn't like, hear him coming. He's got bad hearing. I have stuff to do, though. Yeah, he, he was deaf. They couldn't even hear what he yeah, couldn't even hear what was happening. They just yeah. threw him backwards. Yeah. They just put a bunch of stuff in his face, <laughs> and he's just sitting there like, "What the hell is happening to me?" But the one where he's dead, it's very, very different. Um, because he doesn't have stuff to work on. <laughs> he's like, "Nah, all my, all my good, all my stuff is good." He's finally at peace. Yeah, I'm, I, I got it. Like, I'm I'm I nailed this. I nailed this. You guys are going to be talking about this for a long time. <laughs> well, we are now. Um, his death mask is very different. For one thing, he had had a disease for several months where he had been bedridden. So he clearly lost a lot of weight. But also, his muscles are slack. And, I mean, if you've ever seen a corpse, people say they look like they're resting, which is debatable. But he does look far more rested than he does in the one where he was alive for sure <laughs> yeah, like his sure. his muscles were just just slack you know yeah, he'd was, already he'd completed all the things he needed to do yeah, he's he was like, done. my, he's like, my music is great i'm i'm cool now this just peace from here on out <laughs> so we're gonna start talking about some famous ones some famous death masks uh we're gonna start about three thousand years ago Arguably the most famous death mask was found on the innermost coffin in King Tut's tomb. So if you know anything about Egypt, you've seen Tut's tomb. You know about King Tut. Um, he died somewhere around 1324 BC. And possibly due to the amount of inbreeding in ancient Egypt, Egyptologists think that Tut had a club foot and cleft lip. But also they think he died of a combination of malaria and a necrotic leg. His parents were full siblings, so they think he just had, like, a lowered immune system, and he died when he was just 19 years old, so he he didn't, I guess, have the ability to fight off an infection like he had. This famous mask is said to have been made for King Tut, but there has been some debate that the mask was originally created for his stepmother slash mother-in-law, Queen Nefertiti. It's all in the family, I guess. Yeah, because she it was just too purdy to be him, right? It's really pretty. Yeah. Um, part of the reason for this, though, is that the mask has pierced ears, which were most commonly seen on women and very young children in ancient Egyptian society. Also, interesting, the cartouche, which is the oval that's inside of the mask that has Tut's name on it, Tutankhamun, um, it looks like it might have been filed down and retouched. So that also leads them to believe this was made for someone else originally. Right. And th this is more of like that funerary mask as opposed to like a death mask. If this wasn't intended to be on display, this was supposed to be more of like a helmet type fixture that was left with the body uh, in burial, right? No. This was definitely supposed to be with him for eternity. And we were never supposed to see it. Nobody was supposed to dig it up and display it in a museum in Cairo. <laughs> But we did. So Tut's mask is more like a helmet. It's got the blue and gold nimbus on it, which is like that. It almost looks like hair or, you know, kind of like helmety. Um, it's it's the thing that pharaohs would wear. Right. And and it's also depicted on a lot of their the Egyptian gods, like you would see on carvings and stuff like that. So I believe like Osiris and a lot of those the the the, the depictions of like the animal headed gods, they all almost all of them had like the nimbus kind of thing yes. around the outside and so did like Moses and the Prince of Egypt. Right. Disney. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
I remember that movie. Um, so he has that on his mask and then also the beard. And on the nemesis near his forehead, there are two goddesses. There's the vulture-headed goddess Nekbet and the cobra goddess Wajet. Now, these represented Upper and Lower Egypt, which he ruled. The mask itself weighs 22 and a half pounds, and it includes lapis lazuli, obsidian, and quartz on the eyes, and then a slew of other stones in the collar. The back of the mask has a protective spell written on it from the Egyptian Book of the Dead, and this spell was meant to be a roadmap for Tut for the afterlife. The beard on Tut's mask weighs five pounds by itself. Do you remember a few years ago when the mask made the news because somebody was cleaning it and knocked the beard off? Sure. <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> you don't remember that? No, I you mean... You didn't see that? What do you mean? I'm like, no, I only heard about it when you told me about it when really? you were researching this. <laughs> I don't know. I just uh, keep up with my ancient Egyptian stuff, I guess. I didn't go to school for that. <laughs> so what happened was in 2013, museum workers knocked it off when they were fixing a light. The worst part is, though, that they they didn't really, they didn't do it right. They they put it back on, but they used an epoxy glue to put it back on, which actually damaged the mask. And some of this glue also dried on the face, and then someone scratched the face with a spatula trying to get it off. Like, what the heck? But it's okay, because since it has been restored, and they reattached it with beeswax, which is a much more appropriate restoration method, but I don't know if this beard was ever really on there very good. Because when they found it in 1920s, um, when they found the tomb of King Tut, it was not attached to the mask. So they had to glue it back on at that point. Well, yeah, it was supposed to be for his mom. And well, no, female pharaohs wore beards. Yeah, she wasn't a pharaoh at the time. Ne though. Did Nefertiti? There was a female pharaoh. Uh, well, Nefertiti was the queen, when, but by marriage... She are there was a female up? pharaoh. and I, I, I know really there was a Nefertiti. female pharaoh. It wasn't Nefertiti. Okay, so the female pharaoh was not Nefertiti. It was Hatshepsut. But she did have a beard. So I think she did it partly just to like... What? Oh, to to, to, clar to clarify. Hold on. To clarify. Hatshepsut didn't have a beard. No, no, She no. was attributed a beard this because a pharaohs beard. had beards. Yes. yes. She was given a beard for the sake of... Because of the fact that she was... A, she was, for all intents and purposes... A pharaoh. Yes. I mean, it's not like scruffiness. It's like... She wasn't the bearded like lady. It's beard. It's like that long hanging beard. She, yes. They had that like that that pharaoh-like beard that you see depicted, which just shows that beards are cool. After this incident, eight employees at the Egyptian Museum were sued and the head of conservation was demoted. So I think he was demoted to the head of the like Royal Transportation Museum instead of the full Egyptian museum. The transportation museum? They're yes. Like, you, you like lights so much, bud? Chariots. You like lights? How about, yes. how about you do traffic lights for a bit? <laughs> this is the history of traffic lights. That's what you're in charge of now. Yeah, so he, he didn't get fired, but he definitely got demoted. So the mask is really, it's an impressive piece of history. It's also very important to modern Egypt as well. Um, its last trip to the States netted the country's $10 million in revenue from people just paying to come and see it. Not to mention the tourism to Egypt. So also in Egypt, the mummification process itself preserves the physical features of the earthly body. So even without a mask, some of these don't have a mask, even without that, we can still get an idea of what a mummy looked like in life. I and mean, I've seen recreations of Queen Nefertiti and King Ramses II, and they look pretty cool. Our cat, incidentally, is named after Ramses. So not everyone, of course, could afford a gold mask in ancient Egypt. Earlier versions were made using a material made from linen or papyrus that was soaked in plaster and then molded on a wooden form. And at other times, wooden masks were carved and connected using pegs, like the wooden parts were connected with pegs. Sometimes they would also use the outermost layer of linen on the mummy and they would work to stiffen it with some plaster. And then they would sometimes paint that to emphasize the most prominent features. Some of these have large lips, large nose. You know, it's not really a caricature, but they emphasize the big pe biggest features on your face. This plaster work was also pretty common elsewhere in Egypt. And they would add this plaster onto statues sometimes because plaster is pretty smooth. So they would paint the plaster on top of the statue. And they would use gypsum to make this plaster. 
in a very similar way to how we do it now. Today we mine a lot of gypsum, with three quarters of the total mined today used for plaster of Paris or other building materials. And sometimes priests would also wear masks for the funeral ritual. They would make these to resemble the head of a jackal like the god Anubis, who is the Egyptian god of the dead. And in hieroglyphics on temples, you can often see pictures of people with animal heads, and they believe some of this, at least, would be people dressed with a, one of these masks on their head to resemble the god. Now we're going to move over a bit. Um, there are funerary masks from many cultures in antiquity. Um, Peruvian, Chinese, just for some examples. Uh, one that I've seen myself in Greece, and this one is made from gold that was heated and hammered over a wooden form of a face. This one was found in the ruins of Mycenae, and it was called the Mask of Agamemnon, because the archaeologist who found it thought that it was evidence that King Agamemnon from the Trojan War was real. Nobody today really thinks it was Agamemnon, since the dates don't really line up, and he probably wasn't real. But the German archaeologist who found this one, whose name was Henrik Schliemann, found it on top of a body in Mycenae. He actually found a lot of bodies um, that he excavated, and many of them had masks, but this was the, just the most prominent one. And this and, was actually on a body? Yes, it was on top of the head of a body. The mask actually dates from around 1600 BC, which would be about 400 years before this supposed Trojan War happened. Agamemnon was the king of Mycenae and For leader- For sure. And, no. Allegedly. 100% sure. Allegedly. And he was the leader of the Greek army during For the Trojan sure. War. He and his brother Menelaus- Also existed. He stopped. <laughs> was supposedly the king of Sparta and husband to Helen, who was named, or was called, the face that launched a thousand ships. And she basically went off with Paris. Some say that she ran off with him. Some say that he kidnapped her. She ran off with Paris to Troy. And then, of course, they went after her with their army to siege the city and get her back. Agamemnon was very prideful, and he pissed Achilles off while they were sieging Troy during the Trojan War. And through that, he lost a lot of men. Well, it's because Achilles couldn't be hurt. Well, they was... didn't lose it, did they? Because they actually got in. Yeah, I was going to say, Agamemnon. First of all, Achilles JK. couldn't be hurt because of the fact... He Wait, could be hurt on his heel. He could be hurt on his heel. Hold on, hold on, Achilles hold on, heel. hold on, hold on. You need to back up and do this whole thing because Achilles was on the side of Agamemnon. He was, yes. Did I not make that clear? Well, you said he lost the war because of Achilles. I meant, yeah, I was wrong. I was wrong. <laughs> I'm making that part up because I was thinking he did, but he didn't. He didn't. No. So, I can Ajax killed them all Stop because talking. they were sheep. Stop talking. Okay, if you don't want to know the facts. I'm if you don't okay, want to know I'm the facts about Agamemnon, none of this over. has to do with a death mask Stop anyways. Talking. Stop talking. You are the one who told me to explain Agamemnon. No. I yes. Was just, yes. I, my boy Agamemnon yes. was real. That's all I'm saying. You do you. Go ahead. Agamemnon was the king of Mycenae and leader of the Greek army during the Trojan War. He and his brother Menelaus, who was allegedly the king of Sparta. <laughs> Why are you going to throw allegedly in there? Why are you throwing so and, much shade on these boys? Talking. And husband to Helen, who was named the face that launched a thousand ships. Which if you actually look up. The, you are ruining it, this whole take. If you look. No, that wouldn't be if you didn't. If you'd shut up. If you look up Helen of Troy, every depiction of her has her boobs hanging out. It wasn't really the face that launched a thousand. It doesn't matter. It wasn't the face. That's what they called it. She it, also apparently that's won. That's because they weren't like Stop talking. great tits. They also. Great tits. Well, we let's go to war. Podcast. <laughs> we can. She also won a beauty contest against um, Aphrodite and Athena. Oh, okay. For the golden apple. Agamemnon Agamemnon doesn't exist, but Aphrodite does? This is all wrong. This Come is all, on. And this it, was all a, it was a wet t shirt contest. It. it was a wet t shirt contest. She had great tits. Shut up. Move on. Hey, if I'm just saying, Helen had great tits. <laughs> That's that was a real truth up until the fact that you started making it making it dirty. What, 3,600 years ago? 
she had great tits. No, it's not the great tits. All if you if you look up if you look up pictures of of Helen, all of the portraits or all of the pictures of Helen all have her with a boob exposed. It just it just takes away from her face. Is all I'm saying. My eyes are up here, and you need to respect that. <laughs> says Helen. I'm sure she did. That's why she left. That's why she went to Troy. What happened to Helen anyway? I don't know. She was fake. Go ahead. Move on. Oh, she went back with her husband. They got her and they took her back. Anyway, Achilles was on Agamemnon's side, but Agamemnon had just this complex where he just wanted to be in control. He didn't want Achilles to to get the glory, I guess. And so he made him mad. He went off. They lost a lot of people because of this. But they still won eventually. So, Troy was real. They have found the ruins. Mycenae was real. I've been to the ruins. Agamemnon, not real. Okay? Achilles, also real. Not real. No. They did not. No. His mother did not hold him by the heel and dip him in the river stick so that he could be immortal. Except for the heel where she was holding him. Time's gonna tell. Didn't happen. Time's gonna tell. On that Didn't one. happen. Before we continue with our entry on death masks, let's see what we can dig up from our sponsors. Hey everyone, Matthew here. Just wanted to take a quick time out and uh, thank our some of our supporters and sponsors. Um, today we would like to thank this week's sponsor. Wait, wait, wait. wait. We have a sponsor? We do. We have our first sponsor, and uh, it is a uh, sponsor that, I mean, we are incredibly privileged to have here. What? It would be none other than Morbid Curiosity. Oh. What? No. See, you have to be thankful and grateful for whatever sponsorships we can find. Well, I'd be more grateful if we could pay the bills with the sponsorship. Morbid curiosity. You know that feeling that makes you look at an accident that you're driving past? That thing that drives you to seek out true crime documentaries and tales about serial killers? That is morbid curiosity. Without that dark interest, Macabrapedia wouldn't exist, so we can't understate how appreciative we are to have it as this week's sponsor. Once again, that is morbid curiosity. You can feed yours here weekly on Macabrapedia. Hello, this is Marissa. We wanted to take a moment to give a shout out to our friends over at South Carolina's number one true crime podcast, Carolina Crimes. Carolina Crimes is a show hosted by Danielle Myers, a state law enforcement operative, and Matt Hires, a local radio personality. The two of them cover true crime focused in or connected to the state of South Carolina. They cover crimes involving meth-fueled murderers, famous politicians having sex with inmates on the way to their executions, and vaginas capable of Exceptional muscular dexterity. Matt, am I reading that right? Yeah, you uh, you so are. That's uh, that's what the t-shirt says. I need to find that episode. Episode three. You can find Carolina Crimes on Apple Podcast, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. We now return you awkwardly to the podcast in progress. Awkward is right. All right, so the first type of masks made from life were in ancient Rome. These masks were big in Upper Roman society, though they were reserved for elite male citizens and the political classes. Um, Roman masks were commonly used for the upper class by the 2nd century BC, and they continued to be made through the 4th and possibly the 6th century AD. We know about them because of writings from Pliny the Elder and the Greek historian Polybius. We have, however, found evidence, including molds of women and children as well, so they were sometimes included as the ancestors. So these, which I guess I'll explain in a second. So these were pretty interesting. Um, they were almost certainly created in life during the man's 30s and possibly his 40s. So the prime of his life. These men would shave their beards and then they would use some kind of a fat or olive oil to coat their face first. So that they wouldn't use, lose their eyebrows and eyelashes. And they would just cast around the nostrils, just not cover their, their nose much. Um, they layer linen mixed with plaster on the face, allow it to dry, and then pull off a plaster cast of the face. We don't actually have any examples left of the actual masks, because what happened was they would make the, the mask out of wax, which they would pour into this mold. They would likely use beeswax, but it's not really a material that stands up to time. 
Uh, I did read about a beeswax bust that's been recovered from Naples, but no examples of these masks have been found. I guess we can just hope that eventually they will. These masks were often kept in a wooden cupboard in the atrium of these upper-class Roman homes for generations, along with labels that showed what public office this man held. And they were usually kept there and probably shown to guests who would visit, but they weren't taken out in public until the funeral, where they were worn by actors at the public funeral. So when people came to their house, they'd just be like, yo, let me show you this 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 depiction of my granddad's face. Yeah, I'm going to show you my ancestors. Yo, hey, look at all this. Like, how full is your cabinet? <laughs> <laughs> it might have been in like a status symbol for sure. Sure. I mean, it was I'm... only an upper class Roman home, so. Right, right. Well, and when when it comes to like the women and the children and stuff, I'm sure there's just some wealthy guy who, you know, lost a child or uh, a loved one so early that they went ahead and got that done too. You know or I mean? they felt like the woman had earned her place, I guess, in some instances to be part of the S collection. S similarly too, but not ne necessarily as sexist as the way you put it. I was thinking more uh, of like a history very- History is pretty sexist. A very loved person. And you're like, <laughs> she earned her place. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, but it wasn't as common as the males. Yeah. So, I mean, it had to be a special scenario for them to let a woman be one of the ancestors. Sure. It could have just been that she was very loved, but it just wasn't as common. Sure. Well, no. love it. Love isn't common, babe. Yep. Not enough to make a mask and put it in your atrium, I, I guess. I'll make a mask of you put it in the atrium. <laughs> Promises. I have, to, I have to get an atrium first. Yeah, we need to make, Pri we need to do that. No, priorities is get an atrium. <laughs> yep. If you're still around, make a mask of you. Okay. That's the plan. <laughs> So these were supposed to inspire young Roman men to achieve public office and work for the public good. And the actors wearing the mask at the funeral would dress in the uniform of the highest office the man had achieved in life. This collection of masks showed just how ancient a family was. So the entrance to the home had lots of artifacts, not just these masks. Writers note that these were sometimes smoke-stained, probably because they burned incense nearby, as like a shrine-ish area. Um, with the incense and, you know, the ancestors' masks and the artifacts and all that. Yeah. It was pretty cool. I really wish that that was something that had survived yeah. the times. Yeah. I don't know if the Greeks still do something along those lines, but it'd be really... It, it sure beat, like, trying to do a DNA test on Ancestry.com <laughs> if you could instead just <laughs> open up your atrium cabinets and see all the... Oh, yeah, yeah this is so-and-so from back in the day. Great granddad. Great, 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 great. Grandpa. So a group of college students from the University of Pennsylvania tried to recreate these in 2014. So they made masks using materials that the ancient Romans would have had access to, like strips of fabric, plaster, and beeswax poured into the mold. It takes about 20 minutes for the plaster to harden enough to remove it. They would also coat the inside of the mold with an oiler of fat and then brush or pour small amounts and layers into the mask and build up the wax until a mask was created. Similarly to like making a candle, you yeah. dip it, you pull it out, you let it cool, you dip it, you pull it out, you let it cool. Right. I mean, we went to the Renaissance Festival and they will make the casts of your hand. So you're, you're dipping your hand into the wax and then pulling it out and putting it in ice water and then put it in the wax again and ice water again, et cetera, et cetera, until you get a cast. And that's what it is. You're just building up the layers. Right. They'll it's only, just stronger that way. They'll only do your hands. Because they won't I, do your face there. I, I ask. They won't. They won't do your face. <laughs> but you can't do holding hands. Yeah, but you can't do holding breath. No, you can't. And do letting that. your face be submerged. Mm -hmm. Liability. They would sometimes keep these molds so that new masks could be made for children as they established their own ho households with their own masks and atriums to display them. So. You know, your your son grows up, he gets his own house, and you make another cast of your granddad's face so that he can have it in his atrium. So he sure. can start his collection, etc. Yeah. You can't brighter the neighbors with just stories of grandpappy. You need to have his death mask. Exactly. Oh, granddad was super cool, but dad won't let me have his face. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes they would also repair a mask if it started falling apart, which probably made them look pretty unlifelike after a while. 
if you know the nose fell off and you just patch it with a piece of wax, it's not going to probably look as good as it did to begin with. They probably have professional face wax makers. Maybe. But when somebody dies, you don't really probably remember exactly what their nose looked like. So. Sure, true. Because these would be used in funerals, the eyes were cut out so that the actor could see. In 78 BC, the funeral of the dictator Sola near the end of the Republic had about 6,000 of these masks during the funeral ceremony. So then we're going to move forward a bit in time. Um, we're going to talk about true death masks, which really took off in popularity in the Victorian period. The Victorians actually really appreciated the masks all on their own. Before this, and before the advent of photography, having a death mask or a life mask was the most accurate way to capture the likeness of a loved one. They were true death masks where a decedent's face was covered in grease and then bandages soaked in plaster. You really have to grease it up so it'll come off cleanly, just like you do when you're baking in a cake. Because if you don't, you're going to get layers of cake stuck to the bottom of the pan. Or maybe some of Pappy's eyebrows stuck to the cast. You don't you don't bake the corpse, though. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> this wasn't a, a process that also took part right before cremation. No. no this is pretty unrelated. Uh, so the first layer captures the details, the first bit of fabric that goes down. It will sometimes even get the wrinkles. But you have to add more layers so that it doesn't fall apart because one layer is just too fragile. And then the mold can be pulled off and filled with wax or metal to create the mask itself. And in the 1700s, waxworks had begun to become a very popular paid attraction. Waxworking was seen as a lesser art form, so they let women work in it. Because of this, a woman named Marie Groschultz began her career in wax, making death masks. Her mother worked for a wax maker named Curtu in Paris who took her under his wing. Because of her connection to Curtu, Marie Groschultz started making death masks from guillotined heads during the French Revolution. When writing about this experience, she said that she would put the head on her knees while making the masks. I mean, what else are you going to do with it? It's a head without a neck. Yeah, it's going to roll around everywhere. If you put it on your lap, I guess you can at least keep it yeah, for stationary. Sure. I mean, it's not like they... Well, hopefully they didn't have specifically designed like head holders, head holders <laughs> that they could have. I mean, that, that kind of just seems like a little too like, like be a pike. Yeah. A little, a little too, too appropriate for the, for the means. Like they, like they were expecting there to be a whole lot of heads that were going to be here. I know French revolution. And there all were that. a bunch of heads that were going to uh, be yeah. there. <laughs> seems a little premeditated though. So yeah, it makes sense to just hold it in your lap. Yeah. <laughs> she made the death masks of Louis the 16th. Marie Antoinette, who she knew in life, and Robespierre. And she eventually moved to England and took her waxworks collection on the road. She grew her business, which famously continues today, as Madame Tussauds Wax Museums Around the World. Reveal. There are a lot of famous death masks and life masks that were made just this way. There are museums that have large collections of them, which you can see online. I've seen a couple of these myself. So you've got George Washington's life mask, which is on display at Mount Vernon, which was his home, and the poet John Keats's death mask at the Keats Shelley Memorial Home in Rome. They're pretty striking. It's really unlike seeing a portrait or even a bust of it. It has its own morbid appeal, just knowing that this was an exact cast of this person's face, Sure. knowing that this is on that person's face mm -hmm. at some point. Like, mm -hmm. it's, it's pretty cool. So during the Victorian era, a man by the name of Franz Joseph Gall thought that he could determine the character and intelligence of a person just by the physical features of their head. He would make death masks of criminals in the hopes of finding a link to their behavior and intelligence from the shape of their heads. He called this study phrenology. He looked at skulls and masks of the dead in his study and he believed that the development of the brain influenced the shape of the skull. Gall used this to prove that, prove in quotation marks, that a person's intelligence and behavior could be determined by their physical features, something that unfortunately fueled belief in racism and eugenics. But we'll probably talk some more about that on another episode. No conversation about death masks would be complete without talking about a face that you may not even know that you've seen. 
Before photography was invented, death masks were often made of John Doe's and Jane Doe's so that police could use it to help identify a body. After a few hours, the body starts to decay, and the face becomes unrecognizable before long, so they made death masks as one way to aid in their investigations, in addition to sometimes displaying the clothes and belongings of the found person in the hopes that somebody might recognize them. In the 1870s, or possibly 1880s, an unidentified body was pulled from the Seine River in Paris of a young girl who was suspected to have drowned herself. The story goes that one of the attendants at the morgue was so taken by the young girl's beauty that he ordered a plaster mold of her face. Numerous copies of the mask for the unknown woman of the Seine were made, and some fashionable Parisians kept it in their home as home decor. When the dollmaker Asmon Lairdal began working on a project with anesthesiologist Peter Safar, he remembered seeing this dead woman's face, La Inconnue de la Seine, hanging in the home of his relative, and chose to use that one. Their work created Rassasi Anne and led to this woman's face being called the most kissed face in the world. If you've ever taken a CPR class, chances are good that you've had your lips on the likeness of this unidentified girl who was pulled from the sin so many years ago. This woman's death mask became the face of the CPR dummy. Although, I'm CPR certified, and I don't think that was the face on the dummy, but maybe I'm just mistaken. I did not get to actually... I am CPR certified, and I did not actually get to do any of that on the dummy. You didn't have a dummy? Oh, we had the dummy. Yeah. The teacher did did everything, mm -hmm. and we just watched. And she was like, "That's how you do it." Uh, that doesn't <laughs> and, seem right. And I was like, "Oh, I could totally save a life now. I got that." Well, we had <laughs> we had the dummies, which was just like the upper torso and face. Yeah, yeah. And then there was like a plastic piece that you put into its mouth, mm -hmm. so that you could take it off, and mm -hmm. they could continue to reuse it with different plastic I, I think, pieces. I think that was the reason why we didn't continue with that. Was like they didn't have a lot of those. Oh. So she just did it. She was like, just trust me. This is how you do it. <laughs> and then like two weeks later, they were like, okay, we, the amount of uh, chest compressions has changed and you only do it X amount of time, whatever that's. Yeah. So anyways, I'm see, I, I, I will do my best to save your life regardless of what my certification may lead you to believe. <laughs> you're supposed to do it to the tune of staying alive. So you're supposed to that's, blow into the face, hold, hold the neck up or tilt the chin up, blow into the, into the mouth, and then chest compressions, chest compressions to the staying alive. When I was doing this research, I came across some death masks that have been sold in recent years for a lot of money. So the fascination, the fascination. Fascination. So the fascination is still real. So you can buy copies of death masks like John Dillinger or even originals, but they can really set you back. So the death mask of a Victorian murderer named Benjamin Corvassier, who was hanged with 40,000 spectators, including Charles Dickens, that one sold in 2017 for 20,000 pounds, which is about 26,000 American dollars. One of Stalin's bronze death masks sold for $17,000 in 2018, which was eight times what they estimated it to be worth. This was one of 12 masks created after his death. But the record for a death mask was in 2013, when Napoleon's bronze death mask, which was made after he died in 1821, sold for $220,000. Which I have right here for you. Yeah, okay, sure. <laughs> no, I do not. <laughs> Happy anniversary. <laughs> I mean, he was, It's first of all, it's bronze. Second mm -hmm. of all, it's Napoleon. And third of all, he's he's got excellent bone structure. He was a beautiful man. He, Truly was. I was not expecting that when I looked this up. And you know what? People still make them today. There are companies that will come to the funeral home and make a death mask of your loved one or, you know, a life mask of you. Madame Tussauds Wax Museum still makes face casts for actors when they need it. For instance, I was looking at a video the other day and the actress who originally played Avita in Avita had to get a cast made of her face for a scene where she would be at a funeral because Evita eventually dies and spoiler alert. And so Madame Tussauds did that for her. So they still do it to this day. They also do pretty much the same thing as they've done for centuries for actors when they need to have a model for prosthetics. So they put some kind of oil on your face and then fabric and plaster 
Although now they do have some specialty materials, they do less of the fabric, I think. This was used for Robin Williams and Mrs. Doubtfire, among many other examples in film cinema. You get straws for your nose so that you don't suffocate. If not, that would be a really different, dark kind of death mask. It would be a started as life mask, Transition. ended as death mask. Yeah. <laughs> we don't want that. So it's a little something to stick in the atrium for your kids to enjoy, though. But today, we have photography and videos, so we have plenty of other ways to remember our loved ones after they've died. But the death mask, I mean, it's still pretty cool. Cool enough that uh, we are going to go ahead and make a couple of death masks so you can see... Well, I'm sorry. I guess they're not death masks. Life Ho masks. Hopefully, hopefully yeah. they, <laughs> they, they are life masks that make it all the way through to, to remaining as life masks um, of ourselves that will be posted on our Instagram. We will be posting a step-by-step uh, process as to how to create a mask, whether life mask, death mask, whatever, um, on our Instagram, which is macabrepedia pod. That is M A C A B R E P E D I A P O D. Uh, also on our Twitter and Facebook page, which is at macabrepedia. No pod on that one. Um, and you'll be able to follow along as we uh, do this process and uh, see what it actually takes to make one of these masks that we've been talking about tonight. Yep. But don't get used to it because we're not going to be doing this for every episode. Yeah. We can't actually do this for every single kind of episode because some of these episodes are going to be uh, taking uh, taking stories from points in time or from uh processes that we should not be um posting online right but we could lobotomize something like a i guess a i mean spaghetti squash uh, tune in later as you find out that the lobotomy was actually practiced on cantaloupes before anything else but <laughs> um but that that's that's a that's for another episode if you have any ideas for something you'd like us to cover email us at macabrepediapod at gmail.com subscribe to us wherever you listen if you're using Apple Podcasts, please leave us a comment and a five-star review. The comments are what really get us noticed. Thanks for listening. Please join us next week as we enter another entry into this hour. Macabre. See, why would the adult do that? No whispers. <laughs>